Good morning, afternoon or evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you're joining us from across the world. Thank you for making that uh, journey. Uh, I want to welcome you to Payments Cards and Mobile Webinar in association with First DAG. I'm Alex Rolf. I'm the Managing Director of Payments Cards and Mobile, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. For myself and the panelists, I hope you're all doing well and enjoying some newfound freedoms as we move past COVID and into what we hope is going to be a great summer. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started, please. Um, if you experience any technical difficulties with sound or visual, please use the user interface in front of you to ask for help. And one of the team will be with you right away to get you uh, on the way. Uh, this is a live event and we will have a live Q&A at the end. However, please do feel free to send your questions in as we go along. If your question relates to a specific topic or slide, please do note that down in the question so that myself or the panelists can quickly reference back to that whilst answering the question. And finally, all of the assets regarding this event will be made available at the end of the show, meaning that you can share with your colleagues or review the information again at your leisure. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I think as we are able to take stock of the last 12 months or so, it's well documented that there has been a terrific shift in the use and perception of cryptocurrencies. Today, we're going to be joined by specialist companies that enable stablecoins and crypto for e-commerce and look at the potential impacts that stablecoins and cryptocurrencies may have on the e-commerce market. On the one hand, Visa, MasterCard have declared themselves as enablers for payments, no matter the rails, and started to support digital currencies. Notable moves by major players include Visa's uh, Circle, a crypto startup that created a stablecoin paid to the US dollar. PayPal acquired Curve, a custody startup built to hold users' cryptocurrency safely, and Facebook is strongly pushing its DM project. Uh, it's a stablecoin pegged to the US dollar that should eventually be available via all of its platforms, something like two to three billion people. And of course, big tech are now also using cryptocurrencies to gun for payments. Uh, then on the other hand, we have an evolving regulatory landscape across all the markets that's seeking to understand what the crypto market is and how to regulate it in terms of usage and payments. From the e-commerce perspective, it's always been at the forefront of innovation and trends before they go mainstream, uh, specifically around the cross-border e-commerce space, uh, which demonstrates an impressive example of this growth potential. CBDs and stablecoins will allow PSPs, acquirers, merchants, and gateways to start accepting digital payments overcoming many of the challenges encountered by merchants when it comes to cross-border payments and e-commerce. So the question we're asking today is, are you ready for, about, for what's about to happen next? And luckily, we're here to walk you through those topics. And I'd like to introduce two gentlemen who are experts in their field and the subject matter. I'd like to introduce Ran Goldie, who's the CEO of First Dag, and Tim Van, Os Van Opstal, Senior Executive of Global Sales at Payu. Welcome, gentlemen, and over to you, Ran. Hi, Alex. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for joining. And obviously, Tim, thank you for making the time to join us today. Uh, I will be your, I would say, uh, mini host for the next uh, 15 minutes. I'll try to, to talk a bit about what we see from where we sit as a company that specializes in stable coins in this arena. Of, of e commerce, cryptocurrency, stable coins, to try to try to figure that out maybe together. Uh, and then we will have a great conversation with Tim from PayU. Again, PayU is one of those innovative PSPs at the forefront of technology that we know is, is doing a lot in the stable coin field. We'll talk to Tim about that. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll share some slides with you. Uh, please feel free to ask questions in the background. Alex, our moderator, will will try to present those when the time is right, either now or in the Q and A session that we have later on. Uh, and uh, let's let's all have fun learning more about stablecoins. So uh, I'll I'll start with I would say with uh, with again with saying what will DM and other cryptocurrencies do for global e commerce. The, the the right answer is tomorrow morning nothing and <laughs> why is that because really we're talking about the future here we're talking about maybe a year from now maybe two years from now we're still not 100 percent certain obviously 
but we're full on getting ready for that future. Uh, right now, e-commerce, I'm not, I'm not providing any news to everyone, is about $4.9 trillion. This is only expected to grow. And if you've seen the latest publication by Visa, they're saying that in the past six months, uh, $1 billion of payments went through credit cards that were actually linked to crypto wallets, which is super interesting. And we'll get to that a bit later. So a bit about us, a bit about first. Uh, we've been here for about four and a half years. Uh, a startup out of Israel that started in providing and working with credit card companies, card companies, I would say, and, uh, and acquires and PSPs and allow different exchanges to offer their users to purchase credit, to purchase cryptocurrencies. And throughout our time in the past two years, we've realized what we really want to focus on is the payment space and, and the, and again, the, the fintech and e-commerce space within that, because while we love Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and even Dogecoin, Elon Musk's favorite, we think those are more for speculation, right? We, we think that when it comes to e-commerce, when it comes to payments, what we will see over coming in the next few years are stable coins and their, let's say, more regulated uh, cousins, the CBDCs. Uh, our platform that we've developed over the past two years is, is a simple platform that allows acquirers and PSPs to offer their merchants to accept stablecoin and CBDCs. Uh, and, and again, acquirers today and PSPs, they, they need to face hundreds of different payment methods. Uh, if, they want, if they would need to start implementing different blockchain solutions, uh, add nodes and, and validators and get into that you know, jargon of, of how to do reconciliation on the blockchain, et cetera, uh, they're probably never will adopt it. And what we've done is create a simple platform that currently supports three stable coins that allows those PSPs to tell their merchants, hey, you're already integrated with us. Here's, here's another button you can add to your checkout page, whether it's embedded or hosted. And you, we will take care of everything for you. So for the merchant perspective, they can leverage existing integration once that payment comes through First platform actually takes care of everything. The risk, the merchant wallet, the, the liquidation of that stable coin back to dollars, euros, pounds, whatever, and talking to the blockchain. But again, we're not here to talk about us today. So I'm going to speed this up because there's a lot of content I want to deliver. And again, the conversation with Tim, which would be hopefully uh, much better than just me talking. So a bit of crypto one-on-one. We're not going to teach you guys crypto. Uh, we're hoping everyone here is a bit familiar, but just cryptocurrencies. If you haven't been reading anything in the past, uh, let's say, uh, five years at least, but over the past decade, then you might have not noticed there's a thing called cryptocurrencies. Those are tokens that has some value and they could be issued by, well, anyone basically. But they all use something called a DLT, a distributed ledger technology which means that it's, a, it's something like a shared database across different computers. And again, I'm oversimplifying this, obviously. The most common DLT is called a blockchain, and that could be centralized or decentralized. Uh, it doesn't have to be decentralized. Uh, great example of decentralized currencies are Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. More centralized currencies are, for instance, JP's, JP Morgan's coin, uh, or even the stable coins we're going to talk today, like the Facebook-led project DM. Uh, there's over 4,000 cryptocurrencies in existence. Uh, I would say that about 3,990 maybe are driven by, by human greed of the people who actually issued them so they could make uh, more money while talking about creating uh, an, an amazing future. But there are some crypto projects that are worth uh, investing, and I, I encourage you to read more about that. Uh, a subgroup within cryptocurrencies are stablecoins, and those are the ones we are fascinated with because within, let's say, 10 years, everyone is going to use um, um, a CBDC. We hope. We hope that you know the, the U.S. will issue a, a digital dollar, uh, the U.K. would issue a digital pound, and every country in the world would issue their own digital currency. But until then, we have a lot of corporates creating what's called a stable coin, which is a, which is a currency, that, sorry, a coin that is actually stable in price and is pegged to real asset. Sometimes it's a commodity, sometimes it's a fiat currency, 
But it, what's important to understand, it's issued by a private company and they are subject to regular auditing and licenses. Uh, on the other hand, CBDCs, obviously, as, as the name suggests, central bank digital currencies are exactly the same as a stablecoin. They are one-to-one -one pegged to their underlying asset, but they are regulated and issued by a central bank. That's the only difference. Uh, and those two, CBDCs and stablecoins, are what we think are going to have a huge effect on e-commerce moving forward. So here are four stablecoins you should know about. Um, first one is Tether. And again, Tether has about $62 billion in circulation. It was created by a company called BeatPhoenix and is mainly used for trading. Now, important to say about Tether, this is the... This is the stable coin that everyone likes to, I wouldn't say hate, but everyone likes to talk um, bad words about. Uh, because Tether, no one is 100% sure that this is actually backed by dollars behind the scenes. They had a lot of, uh, I would say, incidents with the SEC. They were recently fined for about $20 million. So I would not expect USDT or Tether to be the star in our e-commerce uh, dream for the next few years. On the other hand, we have USDC, which is a currency or USD coin, which is a currency that was created by uh, an, a coalition called Center, which behind the scene is actually a company called Circle and a company called Coinbase. Coinbase, you've probably heard of, uh, have recently become pub public in April of this year uh, and are strongly pushing USDC as, uh, as their stable coin as well. There's about 26 billion in circulation. And again, it's mostly used for trading. By the way, when I say trading, I mean, if someone is trading Bitcoin or Ethereum and, or any other cryptocurrency, that's obviously much more volatile and they want to switch to, um, to a stable coin because they have uh, taken profits, for instance, then they would probably switch to that instead of switching to the dollar, which would take more time. Now, the third project that's super interesting is Celo. Now, Celo is a, is a project that has been alive for almost four, I think, maybe two, three years now, sorry. And, and Celo has a very interesting concept. Celo's goal is to build a huge alliance, which now has about, I believe, more than 60 different companies, including Deutsche Telekom, which was uh, one of the, the last companies to join. And they are targeting remittance more than anything else. Now their circulation numbers are still small, but they are looking at remittance corridors, anything between, uh, for instance, Germany and Turkey, the US and, and Mexico. And as you all probably know, remittance is huge, has about 800 billion uh, um, yearly volume, but they're also looking at payments because once people get remitted with those currencies, they want to use that money. They don't just want to liquidate it. They actually want to use that to pay the utility bills, et cetera. And the project that we're all waiting for is DM, the artist formerly known as Libra, the project that Facebook started about two, two and a half years ago. Uh, and, and again, this project is probably one of the most ambitious projects because it not only tries to, uh, to, take, to be a global stable coin, uh, that is pegged to several currencies uh, in the US, the dollar, in Europe, again, per country. But it also tried to walk through the regulated path, talking to central banks, talking to uh, the, the local regulators. And uh, for now, there's been a lot of setback because of that. Even though DM is, is backed by a lot of different co great companies, which we'll see later on, it does have its hurdles. Um, so those are the four stable coins that, that I think you should know. And let's move forward and talk about what we all already know. Money's changing. Uh, I've mentioned this a bit. Facebook here, JP Morgan created their own coin. In the US, sentiment is changing drastically. Uh, the OCC, uh, which is the Office of Currency Compliance. No, I'm probably not going to say it right. The OCC has authorized to run custody nodes. And again, this is, this is mind boggling because if you would go to a bank 18 months ago in the US and say, can I host my Bitcoin here? Can I keep it safe here? There'll probably be a sniper shooting in your head. But right now, if you go to a bank in the USA, can I uh, custody my Bitcoin here? They would hug you and say, of course, how about buying more Bitcoin? Uh, and again, China is pushing really strongly their, um, their digital currency. And according to, if rumor has it right, by the Winter Olympics of 2022, 
they're going to require everyone who's coming to visit to download their own apps and use that as their currency. And this would be like the first step of proliferating that currency. Now, there is a battle, as always. So the battle is between the big techs, <clears throat> Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple. Uh, I haven't put Microsoft in here because I haven't seen a lot of activity on, on FinTech from their perspective, but I'm sure it's behind the scenes. The more, let's say, uh, innovative acquirers and PSPs out there like Square and PayPal and the card companies, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, uh, Visa and MasterCard, especially super aggressive about pushing their own agenda and stable coins. And of course, the one person that is also pushing his own coin, Elon Musk. But we're not going to talk about Elon today, even though his dog uh, currency is amazing. So what is the battleground? The battleground is really this place where in 10 years from now, if everyone's using a digital currency, then every person on earth is going to have a digital wallet. And that wallet is what's in the center of this battleground. And there's a lot of different ways to, for companies to get to make sure that you're using their wallet, whether you're a business, a government, or a consumer. Let's look at the contenders here. So Visa is, is the first. And again, you're going to get those slides. I don't, want you, I don't want to read everything. But Visa is one of the more aggressive contenders. Uh, their strategy is to be the network of networks and really be able to originate and terminate new payment flows outside of card rails. Now, surprise, surprise, Visa and MasterCard have now said, we're not just about cards. We're the rails of everything, right? And they tried to acquire Plot for $5.3 billion in January 2020. Uh, they failed, by the way, and later on purchased a, a European company called Tink for, well, at least they got a discount for $2 billion. Uh, but in the meantime, between that, they've realized that, okay, cards are not enough. We're, losing, we're going to lose grounds. I'm not going to say they're losing grounds right now because probably not substantial, but they're losing ground slowly and they are now expanding more and more into crypto. They've added USDC for their settlement platform. Uh, and like I said, they've declared there's more than 1 billion uh, in transactions the first half of the year invested in Circle, which we've mentioned before. And I'm sure we're going to see a lot more from Visa. Circle, the company that I've already mentioned that created USDC, uh, that has about 26 billion circulation, has also um, raised about $400 million recently. And, and it sounds like they're about to be uh, a, new, a newcomer in the uh, in New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so again, Visa backing Circle, backing that US, backing USDC, and that is the stable coin they're targeting mainly right now for businesses not necessarily for consumers because circle has a lot of solution for businesses if you want to you want to open a bank account you want to do payouts etc mastercard not staying behind we're also here to enable customers merchants and businesses to move to digital value traditional crypto however they want it well again uh, we, we welcome this we think this is amazing because card companies like mastercard like visa already have trust of businesses already have trust of consumers if they will push stable coins that would be amazing and they again they accelerated their program in july opened their network in february were part of the raise of consensus which is a very large crypto group that started i, I believe in something like 2014 or 2013 uh, and have recently uh, announced a new rewards credit card with, with Gemini, uh, a very known exchange in the US. So MasterCard not staying behind, but I would say that where it's looking the best right now is in the CBDC arena. So MasterCard is actually the only company uh, that has been able to, uh, to put their, their foothold in the CBDC market. Uh, right now, the only central bank digital currency out there that's alive is actually by a country known as the Bahamas, right? Uh, while there are almost 77 countries trying to create a CBDC, the Bahamas are, are in front of everyone and MasterCard has helped them to put the infrastructure. If you look at MasterCard's publications, they are helping more than 50 different countries to do CBDCs. So MasterCard aiming for governments, maybe, Visa looking at businesses, Obviously, Facebook does not want to be left behind. And two years ago, as we said, they started DM, the project for a blockchain that would go for consumers, do uh, uh, contribute to financial inclusion, targeting remittance. But again, Facebook uh, has 2.8 billion users. They are not going to let those users to, to use a different e-wallet than Facebook's. Uh, 
Um, and for that reason, they have created Novi. Novi is Facebook's wallet. This wallet, if you read the publications, they are targeting this wallet to be part of WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Instagram, all of the surfaces that Facebook has with its 2.8 billion users. Some people will definitely try to call this Facebook's PayPal move, but it's going to be much bigger than that if they would actually be able to push the DM network forward. And like I said before, DM is backed by a lot of big companies, uh, pay you included, that's here in our webinar through Tim, but also Spotify, Shopify, Lyft, Uber. We have some VCs, some nonprofits here as well. Uh, and once this gets out, uh, we, we think that this is actually going to be one of the stable coins with the most impact on the market. And uh, not last yet, but PayPal, again, no secret, PayPal is moving forward and in March has launched their checkout with, uh, with crypto uh, and allowing now users to, to buy crypto through Venmo uh, or pay through crypto with their crypto checkout. So they're actually targeting businesses and consumers. Now, stablecoins could do a lot for PayPal. PayPal only has about 400 million users and they are mostly focused on the US. When stable coins are borderless, they could go to a lot of places. And last but not least, uh, Celo, we've mentioned them. Their stable coin is also starting to gain more and more traction with Deutsche Telekom in the background, pushing that forward and talking about doing remittance uh, again, wherever they operate. Uh, so the battle is on and all those companies are thinking ahead. And again, if I need to guess, they want to make sure that once CBDCs are actually in play, then you will use their wallet. You would use either the Visa wallet or maybe the Facebook wallet or the PayPal wallet. Because if that is where the user manages their finance in a digital space, they will manage them in an app. They will do e-commerce from an app. They will take lending from an app. Um, they will do everything from their app. And these companies want you to use their app before CBDCs are out and everyone has to use them. So uh, before we go to the more interesting part, there's a lot of implication for e-commerce. I try to reduce this to the eight that I think are, I would say most, um, will most help merchants and the entire ecosystem. So the first one is obviously protecting businesses from chargeback fraud. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot more, there's a lot to say about how chargebacks would be diminished uh, today, again, cryptocurrencies in some methods don't even allow chargebacks. Uh, there's a restoring of ownership of data. Uh, so uh, today, a lot of the data is masked from merchants by different payment apps. That data could be part of what merchants now accept because data on the blockchain would be much easier to access. Obviously, lowering of acquiring fees. I can tell you that the solutions that we constantly look at that allow people to in, to accept either cryptos or stable coins or cbdc's <clears throat> are are now charging anywhere between 30 basis points to 50 basis points which again is lower than much than what most merchants pay today sorry and borderless payments um this is this is one of the most i would say attractive uh implications that we hope will happen today a lot of people don't have bank accounts uh, we, we, we don't think of that in e-commerce maybe, but there's a lot of people who partake in, in global e-commerce, but they don't have bank account. They go with cash only. And once a bank account is actually just an app, it will be much easier for those people to, to purchase something across the world, uh, without having all of those complicated rails to go through because they'll just use an app. Instant payouts, obviously no need to talk further. Uh, marketplaces are one of the use cases that we will talk about in a second with Tim from, from PayU because marketplaces are the use case that is supposedly about to make the most out of this. In marketplaces, the companies running a marketplace usually pay double the fee, right? They pay when to the acquirer or PSP when someone purchases a product uh, from the marketplace and then when they need to pay out to the seller uh whether it's shopify or spotify to the artist then they need to pay another fee of sending that money uh even if it's uber drivers who they need to pay to uh those use cases would become much easier with stable coins as prices would be much lower for every transaction it would be much faster Trans transparency for reconciliation and of course reduce fraud because all the data 
is out there. Now, I feel like I've talked too much. Uh, Tim, I think this is where this is where you need to step in uh, and and make this much more interesting. So hello, Tim. I'd, I'll be happy if you'll introduce yourself. Thank you, Goldie. So, um, well, thank you for the kind words uh, and the kind references uh, so far. Um, myself, uh, I work at Payu as, um, as introduce, uh, introduced as a senior executive based in Amsterdam. Uh, our headquarters, Payu is part of Process, um, the Process Group, one of the leading fintech investment companies, um, um, online investment companies in the world. Uh, I work mainly um, in the, in the high risk um, vertical, but also with the strong focus on developing the stable coins um, and the rollout of that within our platforms and our acquiring channel. Perfect. So I'll, I'll I'll ask you a few questions, and again, this is an you know this is a free conversation. Uh, feel free to tell me I'm an idiot if I'm asking the wrong question. Uh, what is Let's start with the first one. You said you're focusing on the high risk. Uh, when talking to those high risk merchants, is there a demand right now for payment with cryptocurrencies or stable coins? Um, well, I think there. Uh, what, what you, you said it right. Um, there's a clear distinguish uh, when you talk about cryptocurrency one side. Um, I mean, cryptocurrency. You have Bitcoin, your Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, the the main the main coins, of course. Um, and then you have stable coins. And the latter, I think, is a lot more applicable for e-commerce. Um, to me, at least at this moment in time, we're not at, at a position where you would say, to true value, let's pay, let's pay my, my rent or my mortgage payment or even a Tesla in Bitcoins. It's too volatile. It's purely too volatile. However, with stable coins, this is a much more applicable um, applicable situation i think not only for high risk merchants but in, in general for merchants this is um, something that is very applicable to look at remittances um getting money across borders indeed uh, quickly transparently uh reducing fraud as well but the main thing i think is where stable coins have the biggest impact is the topic that you already mentioned um, and that aligns quite perfectly with our philosophy uh, is that we want to create a world without financial borders where everybody can prosper. Well, and that means financial inclusion. Financial inclusion means making sure that the underbanked and the unbanked uh, people also get access to the same facilities. And opening up bank accounts um, can be problematic with the old institutions if you look at the, the traditional banking systems. Then if you look at of the people who are underbanked, I think 1 billion have roughly a mobile phone. Of that 1 billion, 500 million have daily access to internet access. With that, you can actually set up a transfer of funds much quicker. Um, and I think that has the, the biggest application and it is our responsibility as a leading payments company to, to participate in that. Yeah, I know, I, I agree, I agree. And, and we've been having a lot of uh, discussions with large payment companies uh unfortunately i can't i can't talk about everyone but i think that that what we get from everything from everyone is is that right now bitcoin is hyped so they might want to say we accept bitcoin but in reality they don't believe and and i have to say we don't believe either that people want to pay with bitcoin that people want to pay with ethereum it's the same as you paying with your uh apple stock right and, and the fact that Visa said that about a billion in volume was, uh, was created in the first half of the year with, with cryptocurrency linked cards, you know, made me think, made me think maybe it could be several reasons why one, maybe we're wrong. Maybe people do want to pay with Bitcoin and we don't understand how the world works. That's always, uh, you know, a possibility Two, maybe that's leftovers from what people purchased in 2017 and they had ten thousand dollars. Now, then it went to one thousand. Now it's uh, thirty thousand. Maybe they want to take care of uh, take care of the, the balance, right? Uh, and and two, maybe that's actually stable coins. But but you said something interesting. You said that there are some things that are moving merchants and, and to new to new payment methods, like the like you know um, allowing for faster settlement times. Uh, 
again, when dealing with merchants, this is your day to day. What's really driving them to new payment methods? Not necessarily crypto. What's what's driving those merchants so we could learn more for for the crypto side? Uh, absolutely. I think the major the, the major change, of course, is the pandemic. COVID-19 has completely transferred the payments market um, and has been an absolute catalyst for a seismic acceleration from cash to digital. Um, and where certain markets were already quite quite advanced, you'll see a, you, you, we've seen a, uh, a, an incremental surge of, of not only the, the, the bigger players who have more, who usually always had a bigger part in brick and mortar uh, sales, move now towards an online space, but also the pop and mom shops, where it was eminent for, for the survival of certain business owners to quickly make that transformation. And now, as in this was not a this, no, it was and it is still not uh, something that 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 took two three months. No, it it has taken. It's now a year and a half. I think we're we're ongoing, um, and consumers do see the see the advantage, of course, of digitalizing. Things are going faster. It is more convenient. You, you have everything by the click of a hand, and the more you you get familiar with that and together with that with if you look at the the sometimes perceived um, mistrust of the millenniums with the central banking systems, I think if you that combine that, this is one of the yeah the main things that that has has transformed the payment landscape uh, significantly, and it's it has no has not shown any signs of slowing down at this moment in time. Yeah, well, thank you. We've been seeing that in numbers, uh, like you said, across e-commerce and. Maybe with with stable coins in mind, um, what markets, whether those are geographies or use cases, do you think actually would would benefit the most from this? Or, well, uh, as I said, I think the, the the and that that ties in good with our with our philosophy and our focus is the high emerging markets, the markets that have. Um, some from time to time, or just in general, a volatile currency, fiat, fiat currency, um, but also have restriction on foreign currencies, um, uh, limitation of foreign currency uh, being left uh, leaving the, uh, the country, or high cost in terms of remittance and getting funds out of the country. I think that that those are the main elements, and the fact of the matter is that the majority of the high costs. Uh, that happen today with international transfers are consumed by the people who have the lowest income. And in all honesty, that is not right. It is not right. Um, it is what it is. And that needs, it, it will not change within days. It will not change within months. But this is, this is a great opportunity to actually address something like this, where if you transfer money, you mentioned, for example, an Uber driver or whatever type your business is, uh, it is just important that if you transfer funds from one account to another or transfer funds across the border to your family, whatever, it needs to be instantly and it needs to be cheap. And it needs to be seamless. And at this moment in time, the traditional system in place doesn't work. And there are great initiatives going. Open banking is one of them, for example, where you see a great adoption in Europe. Um, but if you look at that at a global scale, I think this is the stable coin situation, uh, the, the situation that stable coins have generated for us basically in terms of what we have and what is still to come, I think is very, uh, very promising. Thanks. I, I have, um, I have one fear about adding more, um, let's call it more, more currencies to pay with. And, and I'll try to describe this um, as, as the payment space slowly progressed, what we see is is more aggregators getting into the market, right? We see Apple Pay aggregating a lot of different payment methods behind it. Google Pay as well. PayPal has been doing this for years. Merchants, they don't love changing their checkout page, right? They don't like adding 50 different buttons. And again, unless you are, um, um, I don't know, a casino or, or something else that, that has a lot of like you said, the high risk issues or MCC code issues, et cetera, then maybe you want to have a hundred different payment methods, but, but most merchants don't, right? 
and now that we're introducing more currencies, we're introducing uh, the world is introducing USDC, is introducing DM. There's this and that. How important is uh, the experience for both users and merchants for this? And and are we going to see again? I'm, I'm asking you to guess, but do you think there's going to be like consolidation somehow? Maybe Apple will add pay with USDC eventually, and we'll see it behind that. What's your view on that? Good question. Then, well, I, there are there are several elements to to what you asked, and I'll try to address them as we go. Um, as consolidation, I think that the first part here is that yes, um, at this moment in time, there is not one single company that can serve you effectively globally around the world in terms of payments. If and every con and if there is a company who says they do, I would like to meet them. I, I've been working in payments quite a while. Um, and there is just not one. Um, so it is quite important that you have that broad, that broad variety of payment service providers through one or two connections. I would advise a smart routing engine in front of it to various providers who have the, the payment capabilities suited for each country. And that means local card acquiring, local alternative payment methods, and if applicable, stable coins in certain situations. Then adding more currencies and adding more payment methods consumer adoption or consumer demand will be leading in those i would say i mean um just imagine yourself you have this great you've developed this great product or service that you want to sell online you see a great demand you sell in the us with through your us acquire or in europe through a european acquire and things go well there, I mean, there is a variety of choices that you can use in terms of payment service providers or acquirers that, that definitely meet your need. But the moment you're touching into certain more non-vanilla markets, let's say, um, pick India or Brazil as an example, Argentina, you'll suddenly find that cross-border transactions will actually get you a 35 to 45% approval rate or conversion rate of customers. That means that out of 100 consumers, just 35 or 45 people can actually buy your service. That should never be acceptable. So what you then need to look is, okay, how can I make that a minimum 70, 80, maybe low 90s? That is, that should be your main focus. That should be your only drive to make sure that you can actually sell the product that you have. For this, local alternative payment methods, local card acquiring are a must have. Um, and then, when you've had that part figured out, you need to say, okay, how do I actually get the money across? And stable quiz could be a great accelerator for that as well. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. And and just to touch on, on the last point, I, I think that it's, it's funny what's happening right now. The corporates who are creating stable coins are located in uh, areas where people don't really have issues, right? I mean, Facebook is is and and other companies have, that uh, have created DM obviously are, are not in an area where people don't have cars, don't have access to money, and uh, and and Celo as well. But what those companies try to do is is to do the extra mile, go to the more emerging markets like again like Celo that we've mentioned, and there's another actually stablecoin called Terra that's super active in. Uh, in South Korea and other Asian countries, including Philippines and Indonesia, uh, that is that is picking up. And and I think that I think that someone said in the chat here that our cryptos are be, are making sure that the banked are going to become unbanked. Um, well, I, I would say yes if you're talking about cryptos and if you're in that vision of you know, Bitcoin, full decentralization, let's take over the banks, let's make sure PSPs are dead, let's cut the middleman. The thing is, humanity is not there yet, right? Uh, we're, we're still not there. We still need banks. We still need uh, someone locally to help us. If technology could bridge that gap and if, you know, and PSPs have a, still a major role in, make, in accepting a payment, right? Because there's a lot of regulations. If we could all trust each other, then we don't need no banks, no PSPs, and no blockchain, right? We can just send money, um, but that's still not the case. Um, so w one thing, another thing I wanted to ask you, Tim, before we open questions uh, you know, to the audience, um, putting digital currencies aside, 
which is one of the, uh, I think it's going to be one of the largest trends we're going to see in the next five years. What else do you see as a trend that's happening right now in e-commerce, maybe especially after COVID? Um, well, there are, there are three elements where I, I see um, the most traction. Uh, one is um, deferred payments, the so-called buy now, pay later uh, payments. Um, it's, it's that has been highly uh, popular among users since 2019. But you see, where financially, where finance, where especially tight customers, customers have pivoted uh, to the buy now, pay later payment methods. Um, digital payments, obviously, um, the consumer adapting digital payments during this pandemic has, has has shown such an expansion, has some growth that, um, yeah, it's. It, 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 there has been something positive out of this pandemic from a financial perspective, from a financial uh, technology perspective, um, and cross-border payments. And then I think the the most the most impacting thing there is that you see central banks now actually acknowledging a need um, to 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 step into the stable coin, uh, the CBDC um, world, and actually. Start regulating things around that as well, um, and you'll see that in the news articles. You'll see that positive, negative news, but um, in general, you know, looking at, for example, India is now also about. Uh, I think the central bank there is also about to actually um, take positive actions towards cryptocurrency in an attempt to regulate it in a in a proper manner. And I think once regulating uh, is is settled, that will have the, the biggest impact. Um, at the end of the day, every business must have a holistic expansion strategy, um, and that includes a thorough understanding of the local landscape and customer needs of each market. And if we could globalize that through through uh, CBDCs, um, I'm all for it. Month to month, to be very honest. Perfect. And and maybe to put you on the spot a bit, uh, <laughs> what's your favorite crypto? No, I'm kidding. Uh, to put you on, really on the spot a bit. Uh, <laughs> You're part of a group that, uh, again, pay you is part of a group that's international, uh, and acquire the acquiring business is very is very local, very jurisdiction based, right? So it means that when you go and you support another payment method, you need to make sure that it's okay for all of those different jurisdictions you're actually at. When talking about stable coins. Uh, is regulation a hurdle for for pay you? Uh, how are you thinking about this? Are there certain areas you look for to to push stable coins usage for or cryptocurrency usage for? What how do you think about that matter? Um, I don't see regulation as a hurdle. Um, I mean, if you look at from a, a just pure sales point of view, yeah, of course you, you want to sell, 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 and everybody wants to get rich quick. However, there are no shortcuts in life, and I think the same thing applies for stablecoins. The regulation, the, how better regulation will actually help us adopt uh, this to a bigger extent. Um, and the true success will be um, not only consumer adoption, but as the triangle that you showed in your own presentation, I think that once central banks and regulators are fully on board with this, have a clear instruction. Okay, this is what we expect from a either a crypto exchange or a, from a, a stable coin or from a from a cryptocurrency to be able to use as a true financial institute. Then we have clear rules of engagement, and we're allowed to play um, through the with those. Uh, I would say, as for a typical area of use, yeah, yeah, for 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 us, we we aim as payu side. We we aim to remain with it, it, we all our partners are tied in as, to the majority of our, our vision. And that is, again, building a financial uh, world without financial borders uh, where um, yeah, everybody can prosper. And if we can do that through blockchain technology, that would mean yeah, that, that has the highest potential for success. So our focus will remain at markets like India, Mexico, Brazil, the Latin region, uh, the Africa region, Turkey, Central Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia. Those will be our main focus points um, in the regions where we can actually provide a solution over commodity. Perfect. Uh, Tim, really thank you for, for you know, uh, uh, answering and not calling me um, 
you know, an idiot on the first question. So uh, with that, Alex, if there are any questions from the audience, I think we would both be happy to, to take them on. Sure, thanks guys. Uh, that's, um, here we go, camera's back on. You'll notice I've had to move because uh, someone's mowing the lawns outside, it's really noisy, so apologies for that. But um, really interesting conversation. Um, I think you've covered an awful lot of ground there, both in the in the in the presentation prior to and and the um, and the queries that, uh, and through the chat. But let's take a quick look at what's been going on, and um, and see that there has been some activity. Um, so I think there's a couple of things that the audience is is sort of getting at, um, and one area that I'm particularly interested in, in, in as well, just because. Ran, you've sort of you've alluded to it in a couple of ways. One is the total size of the econ market. One is this um, billion dollars that that you mentioned that the Visa have come out this this kind of number. And so I think one of the queries that, that's that's being asked is, what does the acceptance of crypto stable coins do for the total addressable market for e-commerce? Um, does it change it significantly? in terms of size or is it as you mentioned before is it just uh, adding new ways to pay um any thoughts from from either of you on on that yeah i'm i'm, I'm happy to offer my thoughts uh tim if you want to join uh, but i uh, i think this is exactly one of those moments in time where technology adds um uh, you know a factor of of of, of people of audience to something that already exists. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, I think that the telecom, telco industry has been changing rapidly over the, the last 20, 30, 40 years, right? And, and while we are still making phone, phone calls, we can now do amazing things with our phone. Uh, and in the same way, I think the finance, finance industry is changing drastically. And I think that while we still would be able to do transfers between one another, we could be, we could actually do amazing stuff with digital currencies, and and what that would cause, and it's already been proven that when there is a huge technological leap, it usually gets to emerging markets first because they need that leap, and they usually just hop uh, like above the existing solution like the, like emerging market some markets will never see plastic cards right like brazil for instance i don't think they'll see plastic cards i think they will just hop from whatever the, what they have today which is usually boleto for instance right when you pay and you go to like a 7-eleven and you need to pay with a, a qr code and and that tells amazon you bought that product uh, they will just hop directly to digital currencies and that would make a lot more people and give them a lot more access to global e-commerce. Uh, the same way, I'll give another example that you know when Robin Robinhood, the uh, most uh, the most notorious app right now for trading, when they started, they didn't say, you know, there's like uh, 10 million retail traders. We're gonna make their experience better. No, we're going to make hundreds of millions of people who are not doing this now be part of this. So uh, I don't know if trading is the best example for you know for everyone's uh, uh, health in the world, but but what I'm saying is I think cryptocurrencies and specifically stable coins and CBDCs once we get to those would actually create huge markets and, and will allow everyone to participate. Well, today we're not allowing everyone to participate. Tim, do you do you agree? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And to add to that. Um... I mean, I, I used to work for a payments company that started as um, the Dutch Post that, that was founded from a Dutch Post uh, company. Uh, I'm not saying the Dutch Post, but a Dutch Post office company that founded was at some point, uh, I think around 30 years ago, had the, the luminous idea of saying we're going to allow our consumers to pay via uh, an online service. Um, we don't know exactly how we're going to do this, but sending a physical bill all the time it really doesn't make sense let's try to do this online everybody laughed at the moment in time nobody saw the applicable use of it it was one of the first payment service providers in the netherlands and i can say they fared quite well um it is it's a matter of we all see the applicable use of of the usage of of, of these products 
Now, at the end of the day, a few will remain. Um, it won't happen overnight. It won't happen in two, three months. But I think once this gets more broadly adopted, yeah, we will move forward quite quickly. Just take India as an example. India, a population of, I think, 1.4 billion people. Credit card penetration is 2%. 2%. It's still a massive amount of people, but 2% is nothing compared to if you look at the great scheme of things. So if you then look at UPI, for example, how quickly that rolled out in India and how quickly that was adopted, that shows that how an emerging market is way faster in terms of if you bring somebody, if you give somebody an alternative, they will grab it. Um, and I said, I think it is easier to grab to nowadays to to have a mobile phone than uh, in certain regions that to have a bank account. So I think we we have great potential here. Cool, thanks guys. So let's just keep it moving. Um, there's an interesting question about stable coins and CBDCs. Uh, it's, the question is what happens to stable coins if CBDCs are launched? Is, there, is there a world where these can sit next to each other or does one supersede the other? I, I think it's, uh, Again, it's like uh, stable coins might become like rewards money, right? Uh, if and it'll become in smaller um, uh, ecosystems, right? But I think once CBDCs are out, that's it. We, we won't be needing stable coins. They're a patch right now. Yeah, I agree. And does that does that then is that then the same for crypto? I mean, do you think that that the um, that the use of uh, Bitcoin and stuff like that? diminishes because because you know 70 i think you said 77 countries or so are now working on cbdc's if if they have those does the do, do bitcoin dogecoin ETH, do they become diminished by it or do they are they able to 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 remain relevant in the market no i think they have a different again everyone has a different perspective what crypto are actually used for but let's say I, I'm all for Bitcoin, but I think it's a it's a store of value, and and you know a lot of millennials look at this as the new gold, uh, right? So I, I think even with CBDC, that has a really good chance of staying. Other stable coins, maybe uh, sorry, other cryptocurrencies, maybe not that much because a lot of them are talking about payments. Uh, but all in all, I would separate between the let's say uh, crypto world, cryptocurrencies world, to the stable coin and CBDC world. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure we'll see a lot of effect on that angle. No, I agree. Uh, most uh, I see Bitcoins, um, yeah, indeed, more as as something as people invest like gold. Uh, people, if uh, there are people who buy elements with gold, uh, I would I assume, but the majority of people don't walk into a store or mail you or call you say hey. Um, the money I still owe you, I'll send you one of my gold bars. It just doesn't happen that way. So um, I think it is more an investment tool, uh, an investment element. Um, I mean, some Bitcoin, some sorry, sorry, some cryptocurrencies show a little bit more applicable usage. But at the end of the day, I think there, as Goldie said, there will be a main separation between Bitcoin uh, cryptocurrencies who just basically have value for trading towards the actually usage of CBDCs uh, or stable coins. Yeah, pre pre presumably also some of those that exist for anonymity will will remain relevant for exactly that, 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 that reason as well. Okay, so um, moving on again, uh, besides settlement efficiencies and cross-border payments, can you please elaborate why stable coins and CBDCs are better than electronic fiat currency transfer capabilities today? The same issues with jurisdictions and need for central authority and clearing will remain. Well, yeah, I can, I, uh, let, let, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the, this is a long discussion uh, and there is not a simple answer to that question. I have to be very honest with you. I'll be as transparent as I can about it. But in certain markets, um, take an Argentina or Nigeria as an example. And I know I'm touching specifically on markets that are quite volatile, but that, uh, that helps my story. Um, in a country as Argentina, there is a limitation on foreign currency that can go out of the country and you have a currency that is quite volatile. So if you then can say, well, actually getting the money out of the country, because as a merchant, you might not need 
where you probably don't need the Argentine pesos or whatever the currency is at that moment in time of country, you don't have an operational cost or an operational need for it. So you probably want to have dollars or euros or pounds or whatever. One of those three major currencies, well, first the converting. Well, there, as I said, there is a limitation on foreign currencies in some countries. So there's a queue and financial services are normally at the end of that queue. So before you can actually transfer those funds to your dollars, there's going to be a period of time. Then there is a settlement period of time and so on and so on. So at the end of the day, you're exposing yourself more and more and more and more to a volatile currency. Then taking the fees of transferring that funds from country X to the US or to the UK or to wherever you want it, it's going to be very pricey and costly. Again, this is going to take days, two days, three days before you actually see the funds again on your bank account. If you can transfer that to, if you compare that to CBDC or stable coins, where it would be instantly. I mean, I, I know cases where it's up to 24 days. If you hit a, a 24 hours where you actually hit a few uh, different middlemen. Um, but if you would have a direct integration with a processor that is able to do that instantly for you and instantly correct, you could have your money instantly as well uh, converted to a set price. And I think that is the strongest point of, uh, compared to a fiat currency. I want to offer something else from a technology point of view. Uh, I've been, uh, again, I've been a programmer for most of my life. And, and when I look at CBDCs and, and I'll try to make this short because I know we don't have a lot of time, but, you know, programmers, we had a tough life uh, in the last uh, 30, 40 years. And then Mark Zuckerberg came and we became nerds and now we're cool and now we build stuff and now we program money. Right. And that's amazing. And, and when I look at CBDCs, what I think is this is creating a language, OK, that is, is based on technology, but it's a language for all, all of the world to talk in the same uh, around the same parameters because today banking systems are you, you think they're connected they're really not connected behind the scenes not, not most of them are not and, and if we can make cbdc's work on uh, either a common infrastructure or at least have api so they could talk to one another maybe we could actually also solve fx and again i'm sorry tim i know that uh psp's acquirers make a lot of money on fx but maybe we can you know we can cut fx out so I look at this as it's like asking, and there was someone here that asked this, it's like asking in 1995, what would the internet be used for if we put that technology on the shelf? Would I be able to tell you we'll have this webinar? Uh, probably not, but, but or other amazing stuff that we're doing with the internet, uh, no. But this is, this is like the starting point, put the technology everywhere so we could start building more uh, amazing applications on top of that. That's it. Yeah, great. Thanks, guys. Understood. Okay, so look, I think one final question, um, and it's more of a kind of personal question for, you, for, for both of you, and, and it's around re regulation. You know, we, we, we've seen what's been going on in the market recently. We, we understand potentially why that's happening. From your perspective, would you rather see a positive and rich regulatory environment that these things sit behind and you and everyone knows what they're doing or would you rather leave it as it is i would go for the first yeah uh, me too in a heartbeat i've tried the excellent. second it doesn't work <laughs> well it's not work well it sort of has today self self-regulation is, is is always interesting but i think ultimately it's um it's what once it once it reaches this sort of broad place right where we're talking about consumers and their money and making payments for for real goods and services you know you you, you kind of want to know where things stand which is why i was interested about the point about you know reducing chargebacks right at the moment i'm i'm pretty clear about these by using crypto you can get away from from having to have chargebacks but in the future you, you would probably end up with the same infrastructure where irrespective of whether you use a card or, or anything else, the, 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 the kind of chargeback infrastructure would be there to, to, to protect the consumer ultimately, or, or indeed the merchant. Well, the, 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 the biggest advantage, of course, is that it, as there, there, there's going to be, if, if widely adopted, you'll, there is going to be some reduce of amount of fraud where I think where you cannot say as a consumer, hey, I did not push that or I did not actually, actually authorize that money. And that, that goes from, from one point. It's, it is almost untouchable. So I think that 
there is a good potential for that. Um, how that eventually will will roll out, yeah, yeah, we'll have to see. But I think in general, um, reg strong regulation, strong fair regulations uh, around the globe would make a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Ran, um, we've hit the uh, we've hit the hour-long mark. I, I'd like to uh, offer you the opportunity to say a, a few final words if you have them. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I know we're almost uh, at the top of the hour. I'll just say that if you are thinking about stable coins, you're thinking about cryptocurrencies. There's obviously a lot more to learn. Uh, we're here to help. If not us, then go read. The future is here, and two years from now, we're gonna see billions on in volume in that so go, go and learn more so thanks to ran thanks to tim really appreciate your, your time and, and efforts today thoroughly interesting conversation between the two of you uh, as i mentioned some great slides there to, to kind of prepare people for the conversation um i think from from the pcm perspective you know what we saw a year ago and the weight of content that's coming out now about crypto and about it, payments acceptance and the stable coins, crypto, CBDCs, it's, it's, it's absolutely coming. Regulators seem to be on board in terms of what they want to do now as well. So, you know, I, I hope that you think that you heard it here first, but um, you've got a couple of great experts here that, that, that have hopefully answered your questions. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's aim to keep the conversation going. We really appreciate your time and the attendance today. And um, we look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you. Thanks.